Welcome everyone to the Building Centre for tonight's event. I'm delighted you could make it for this fantastic event as part of our Retrofit 24 programme. I'm Laura Broderick and I'm part of the team who's been working on the exhibition upstairs. And if you haven't had a chance to look around before today's panel discussion, there'll be a bit of time after the event that you can go in and sort of take it all in, read the case studies, get to know um, what we're saying about the reuse agenda for our commercial, cultural and civic buildings through that. Um, the events programme, this is the second in our event series. Um, we are looking at various topics to do with the retrofit agenda for those non-domestic projects. And um, tonight we're focusing on heritage and obviously you've all got a keen interest you hear um, so you must be fans or working in the sector, so it's great that you can join in and you will have a chance to ask questions and be part of the discussion later. Um, we do have fantastic speakers and we've got a chairperson who I'll hand over to shortly. Um, but before we get started, there are some housekeeping notes. Um, if you could turn your phones off or onto silent, that would be much appreciated. Um, I'll just give you a moment to do that. Um, I see some of our speakers are also doing that. Um, we don't have any fire drills planned so if you do hear an alarm it will be genuine it will be for real and we will have to evacuate the building and um, obviously i work at the building center my manager john bonning at the back will also be here to support and guide should that be needed everyone's phone now on silent <laughs> Um, we are recording tonight's event and it will be published on our YouTube channel afterwards. Um, so you can take notes, obviously, um, but we will have a recording that you can uh, refer back to afterwards. Um, so I'm not chairing. We have a fantastic chair, Marco Sayer, who I'll introduce shortly, who will be doing that and introducing the speakers. Um, the topic, as you can see, is planning for change in heritage estates. Obviously, there's lots of events and discussions about heritage buildings and heritage projects projects as we look to conserve, protect and celebrate those types of projects. But what I think is particularly special and timely for our Retrofit 24 series is discussing and sharing on the decarbonisation and retrofit um, process within that heritage space and sector. Um, I'm sure we've all got many projects in our minds or workplaces um, and I was just reflecting on of today's events and thinking about Newcastle Cathedral. I popped in a couple of years ago, I think it was summer 2022, with my kids on a kind of day trip and thought I'll just be in there for like a quick visit, show the kids the cathedral, in, out, carry on. Actually, we spent almost an hour there enjoying the spaces. The underfloor heating was fantastic. I didn't know that was in place there. And then looking up on Purcell's website afterwards, I realized that's because they've installed is it air source heat pumps to inordinately partially uh, manage that and avoid the kind of heating of the full huge massive space and avoiding that kind of loss and waste of heat through that so all those projects that are not just about bringing those projects and um, back to life through a conservation pro project and process but planning for change planning for the future i'm sure we're going to have some fantastic examples of tonight and it would be great to hear your personal stories through the q a afterwards so to pass on to Mark, who's going to be chairing, um, we're so delighted that he's offered his time to do this. So Mark Hosea is Director of Estates for the Old Royal Naval College in Greenwich. Um, he is a senior property professional with much experience from the private and charitable sectors. He currently provides strategic leadership for the Old Royal Naval College conservation program, ensuring excellence in the care and presentation of the building, the grounds and the collections. Mark is also planning and progressing the next series of the major development projects across the estate. So it's fantastic he can chair tonight. Um, he will introduce our speakers, but I personally want to thank from the Building Centre all our speakers and all of you today for attending. So over to Mark. Uh, thank you, Laura, and thank you, uh, John, for uh, this uh, amazing event this evening, and thank you all for coming and uh, participating. So I will give a brief description of myself uh, for the benefit of blind and visually impaired people who may be present tonight or access the recording of the event when this becomes available online. Uh, so I am six foot seven, um, short hair, uh, going grey, um, and I am wearing a pink shirt and a blue linen suit. So I would invite our panelists when they come on stage to do their presentations to equally describe themselves, which should be quite humorous when we come to Tom and his beard. 
<laughs> so um, I will give a brief introduction to myself uh, and then I'll introduce the panelists for this evening. So my journey in this uh, field has been a long one. Uh, it started in the late 90s while studying social and political studies and I majored in politics. But the, my favorite module was environmental politics. Uh, and through that, uh, with James Meadowcroft, uh, which is always a good sign when you remember the name of your uh, teachers, uh, he inspired me and we studied things like the Limit to Growth uh, report uh, from the 70s, which obviously indicated that uh, resources were finite and that we might actually have to manage our resources carefully if we're going to sustain ourselves on this planet. Then you were into the uh, Brundtland report, which obviously defined sustainable development and studying that. And then obviously, as we progress uh, through the decades into the COP uh, and the Kyoto Pro Protocol and obviously the Paris Accords. So my journey has kind of been a long one uh, in that regard. And uh, now we are here studying kind of, you know, retrofit. <laughs> That's the first fine. Whiskies are on you this evening. <laughs> so. <laughs> so last year I started as uh, Director of Estates and Conservation at the old Royal Naval College. Uh, and upon starting that, uh, looking at uh, the heritage site, 17 acres, Christopher Wren architect uh, design buildings on the Thames, and high priority, how do you decarbonize this estate? What are you going to do? And I still ask myself that every morning. Uh, how are we going to do this? <laughs> I've never been heckled by a phone on that. Uh, <laughs> AI is such a wonderful thing, but we'll, we'll come on to AI and the use of AI in developing these things. So uh, that's a, no a novelty for me. So here we are now, 2024, and here we are, Retrofit 24. So we're grappling with the questions, planning for change in heritage estates, and the pros and cons of retrofit within that context. So on to the panelists uh, for this evening, and it's a great pleasure that I introduce them to you in order their presentations. Uh, these presentations vary in length. Uh, I will try my best to rein some of them in that uh, are overly long uh, and expand some of those that are overly short. Um, but I think the key thing is we want to engage and get to the question and answers and actually have a discussion and conversation with you, hear your experiences, your questions, and actually kind of, you know, move things forward in this field. So first speaker tonight is Laura. She's head of sustainability and leads Purcell's sustainability strategy and processes driving innovation across the practice. As a qualified architect with over 14 years experience, she has developed a broad range of skills, working on a range of projects from large scale master plans to sensitive historic sites. Her role is to educate and advocate for the environmentally and socially conscious design at every stage of a project. Laura is also driving the sustainability agenda at an industry level, participating in a number of initiatives, including LETI, London Energy Transformation Initiative, where she is contributing to the Letty Client Guide for Net Zero Carbon Buildings and numerous other short publications. She sits in a working group for the Skills for a Sustainable Skyline Task Force, which is working to understand current barriers, identify solutions, and promote the green skills needed for our transaction to net zero. Transition, sorry, to net zero. It will be a transaction if we're into carbon trading, but that's it. <laughs> A whole separate debate which we might get onto. Uh, she is also an active member of the Architects Climate Action Network. Then we'll have Alex uh, McCallion, who oversees the maintenance, restoration, and conservation of the cathedral at York Minster and its 52 precincts properties and services. He led the development of a master plan for the precinct, brought forward as a neighborhood plan, and adopted by City of York Council as part of the development plan for the city in 2022. Alex is a passionate about heritage of the United Kingdom and is driving the sustainability agenda in heritage adaptation through his pioneering work. Followed by that, we've got Alex, another Alex, so it'll be easy tonight with the questions. You'll have to differentiate between the two. Um, Alex founded Scott Whitby Studio in 2014 with a desire to work with communities and cultural organizations in the creation of evocative architecture with a low environmental impact. Alex's hands-on involvement in every project since has ensured that this is what Scott Whitby Studio continued to do. Whether a public square, private home, or civic building, Alex's approach guides each collaboration. The work of Scott Whitby Studio has won awards nationally and internationally, 
including the British Construction Industry Awards Project of the Year 2023, the Reba Journal McEwen Award, and a Design Award for Rebirth of the Year in 2022. His particular expertise focuses on the adaptive reuse of buildings and structures and finding new imaginative ways to reinvigorate them for the 21st century. Teaching has always been an integral component of the practices processes and Alex combines leading Scott Whitby Studio with being an Associate Professor of Architecture at Kingston University. He also holds a visiting faculty position at the Berlin International University of Applied Science, where he runs a course on restoration and conservation. Prior to this, he led the Architecture and Physical Design Cluster at the University of East London and has taught at Architectural Association, the Welsh School of Architecture and the International University of Architecture in Venice. Alex sat on the Reba Council for 10 years, sitting on the board of the Architectural Trust, as, a, as well as Education, Membership and International Relations Committees. And last, but definitely least, is Tom. <laughs> Tom founded Oculus Management to do good work with good people, and leads with his experience of developing master plans and strategic works programmes for various sectors, including arts, heritage, culture, leisure, commercial and education. Tom has extensive experience working in the built environment, having worked on both contemporary and listed buildings. He has sector leading knowledge and experience in the development of significant capital programs. And he is an advisor to Rochester Cathedral. He holds the freedom of the city of London and is a liveryman of the Worshipful Company of Masons. I'm glad they wrote those uh, because that's probably not how I'd describe some of them, but um, we'll have those conversations in the pub afterwards. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Laura onto stage to do the first presentation and they will subsequently go through all four presentations uh, before we start the question and answers. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Great. Does this work? Yes. Do I really have to describe myself? I think you can tell from my voice I'm not a six foot seven man, so <laughs> we'll, go, we'll just stick with that. <laughs> Um, so I'm not going to introduce myself because that's been done so expertly, um, but uh, I will introduce Purcell. So Purcell are the leading heritage architecture firm and we're a mix of architects, heritage consultants, building surveyors and master planners. And we uh, specialise in the conservation and adaptive reuse of historic built environment. Um, and I, with the privilege of going first, get to kind of set the scene a little bit. And I always like to start with making sure we're all speaking the same language. And I know there's probably more experts in the room that can talk ha happily about heritage than myself, but, <laughs> but when we talk about heritage, we're talking about all inherited resources which people value beyond mere utility. So we place values on our built heritage that go beyond cost per square metre, and we impose protections in them through listings and conservation areas um, that values their cultural contribution. And it's no coincidence that most our most visited towns, cities and tourist attractions in this country are the ones that are emblematic of our rich history, visually cataloguing centuries of human ingenuity and cultural development. Now, the conservation of our built heritage is sometimes seen as a barrier um, to change and progress, especially when talking about retrofit um, and energy efficiency measures. But the, ter the term conservation actually means the protection of plants and animals, natural areas and interesting and important structures and buildings, especially from the damaging effects of human activity. So conservation in all its forms is about responsible stewardship of our inherited world. And with that, it is intrinsically linked to supporting planetary health and conserving our natural resources. But despite this inherent alignment of those goals, uh, let's not pretend adapting heritage is without challenges. Um, we, of course, need to be sensitive to... Um, the challenges that that involves, but it doesn't mean we can't be ambitious, even uh, e even all of, probably all of us at some point have lived in, worked on or visited historic buildings that have adapted as society has evolved and needs have changed. We've all adapted, we've, we've been adapting buildings to suit our changing lives and needs for as long as we've built buildings. And it's exactly because of the adaptab adaptability of our historic environment that it's allowed it to survive for such a long time. There, is, there was a report that came out last year, I think, uh, on the heritage and carbon skills gap, and that noted that nearly a quarter of all UK homes and a third of all commercial buildings are historic buildings, and by that we mean they were built pre-1919. 
And the report estimates that retrofitting these buildings would equate to around 30% of the annual carbon reductions needed to meet a sixth carbon budget. So doing nothing with our historic buildings is not an option and doing something requires a collective, collaborative effort and a shift in attitude. So I've been working with the City of London um, with other members in Purcell for the last 18 months. And as part of this, it was called a, a historic building challenge and we carried out extensive engagement with owners and occupiers of listed buildings in the square mile to try and build a better picture of where we are currently, what the challenges to carbon reduction and climate resilience is in heritage properties, and what is needed in order to facilitate greater action across the city. And perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, some of the key challenges highlighted were things like cost and lack of funding, lack of government support, the challenges of building a viable business case in these very complex, sensitive settings. A lack of coherently communicated and readily accessible advice and guidance was also cited as a bit of an issue with some, some of the open source resources available maybe being a bit too complex or um, disconnected. Obtaining planning and listed building consent was also seen as a challenge with a lack of consistent advice across local authorities seen as unnecessarily confusing. But sharing lessons, providing strong collaborative networks of peers and mutual benchmarking were all seen as really positive opportunities that we could help with. So there's a QR code here. We developed a toolkit in response to this engagement. Um, it's available as a PDF. Um, I sadly don't have any hard copies with me. There's one floating around, but I think we've saved it. <laughs> It's going to go in the exhibition, though. Um, but the goal of this toolkit is to provide easily accessible advice and guidance. And it's not to kind of overwrite all the great advice that's already out there, but more just to signpost to it. Um, and it identifies eight core typologies common to the square mile, but that do have relevance outside of the city as well. And it, it acknowledges that there's no one-size-fits-all solution when it comes to heritage retrofit, but there is a common approach which is founded on best practice principles. And it's kind of tried to describe it in this diagram here and breaking it down into nine steps, each of which are described in more detail in the report. Um, but it, this diagram is trying to show that it's an iterative, not a linear process. And it, it should build upon knowledge and expertise and continually reevaluate decision making. So as, at a, as a high level summary, I would encourage you to have a look to read through the whole report if it's something that's interests you. But starting at number one, starting from a position of knowledge and understanding what is important about your building, understanding that historic buildings behave differently to new buildings, particularly in relation to moisture and air movement. So understanding there's an inherent risk associated with getting it wrong. But there is also a risk of inaction with the climate changing so rapidly. How do we ensure our buildings are able to cope with increased extreme weather events, for example. Number three, identifying opportunities. I'm going to come back to that in more detail in a second, but moving on to developing, developing a plan that ties into plan maintenance regimes or other capital works programs to capture opportunities in the most efficient and effective way. Developing a business case which acknowledges that the benefits of adapting a heritage building go beyond just car carbon savings, but reducing, uh, improving occupant comfort, creating healthier environments, increasing market value, just as a few examples. Um, moving on to six, looking at developing appropriate level of detail and utilising professional expertise to consider issues like compatibility with future phases, whole life carbon, vapour permeability, ventilation and thermal performance. Engaging with local authorities at the appropriate time and um, as early as possible when, when it's required and Historic England and other advisors. Finding a contractor who's familiar with what your building typology is and the construction and shows an interest in what you're trying to achieve and how you get there because building quality plays an important part in performance. And then finally, the ongoing monitoring and long-term testing and oversight of the delivered outcomes to in engaging with building users and testing things against the original brief and feeding back those lessons into future projects. So just to dwell on this one for a little bit longer, so this is about identifying opportunities as part of a whole building approach. And that whole building approach is about seeing the building as a system of interconnected users, materials and services, and understanding that these things all impact on energy consumption and they're all interrelated. Fundamentally though, 
and this is true of any retrofit, the greenest energy is the energy you don't use. So this hierarchy is trying to show that if you start from a position of knowledge and understand your constraints, your context, your condition, your energy use, how the building's used, and then work through trying to eliminate energy use through good building maintenance and efficient use of space, looking to mitigate the impact of unavoidable um, energy and resource use through efficient systems, then looking to improve and the performance of existing building fabric through appropriately specified and detailed interventions, and then looking to incorporate active zero carbon energy technologies. And what this could include solar panels or heat pumps or something. Um, and this final measure is essential to addressing climate emergency, but jumping to this step too early without doing the other ones and trying to reduce your energy use as much as possible can risk having solutions that are need to be larger and work harder and ultimately cost more to, to install and to run. So within the toolkit, we wanted to showcase some of the work that is already going on in the city. So there are references to really great exam examples that have taken, taken this approach. So a couple of my favourites. So St Andrew's by the Wardrobe is a church that, after energy efficiency measures, they managed to s install air source heat pumps in the belfry at the top there. Um, Merchant Taylor's Livery Hall, which has been undertaking long-term energy reduction strategies since 2012, um, and has accumulated in the solar panels that you see on the roof of their livery hall. Museum of London in Spitterfields, that's a CGI, it's not finished yet, you probably already know about the project. Um, but they took top uh, opportunities as part of the capital, the huge capital works pro pro project that was going on, to insulate the roof of the poultry market, which has got the domed roof on the top there, which is great two listed I think um, and finally I just wanted to leave with this quote which is just saying that the con conservation of our built heritage is always more about the future than it is about the past so both in terms of the physical built remnants we leave behind but also their ongoing environmental impact it's very important we consider the legacy we leave to future generations Uh, I'm uh, Alex McCallion, I'm six foot two and <laughs> rapidly receding, which you'll see why when I talk you through the next seven years <laughs> in ten minutes. So I'm on the naughty step, I've got far too many slides, but you'll, you'll see why. So um, you'll all know York Minster, but you might not know that uh, the Minster sits in a precinct extending to seven hectares of York City Centre. And it's an incredibly complex part of the city. Um, we own 53 properties, all but one are listed. Three are grade one listed, 80% of the precinct is scheduled, so I can't put a spade in the ground more than six inches without permission from DCMS. It's under huge public scrutiny, quite rightly. It means an awful lot to the city. So how on earth do you drag a medieval precinct into the 21st uh, century to make it sustainable? And when I talk about sustainability this evening, I'm talking about three core strands of that. Financial sustainability, so that we've always got the money to care for York Minster in its precinct, environmental sustainability, so we can meet the challenges of a rapidly changing climate, um, and heritage craft skills. So we've always got the skilled men and women to look after these precious buildings. So very quickly, it costs £33,000 a day this uh, budgetary year to safely open the Minster and do what we can to look after it. So we're working on about 10% of the building at the moment, and we receive no regular central government funding, unlike our European cousins. Take from that what you, uh, you will. Um, and um, we rely very heavily on um, paying visitors. 50% of our income comes from people paying £18 to come and look around the cathedral. Most understand why it costs so much money, but a lot don't. Um, and probably because they think the, the government look after these buildings. And our costs, our fabric costs and our capital costs, all of you in, in construction will know, are rising. Not as bad as last year, that's the grey hair, but um, they are still rising. So, um, and then environmental, this is a little microcosm of, of York Minster, the rapid cavernous decay of our stone, which is getting worse. We've got cleaner air, yes, but we're seeing much more intense rainfall. I've been at the Minster for seven years now, and I'm seeing a lot more rain, and we cannot get it off the building quickly enough. That leads to saltation, which leads to delamination and the cavernous decay, and it's getting worse. It's, it's really, really uh, worrying. And of course, the Church of England quite rightly have set an ambitious target for us to get to net zero by 2030. That's in six years' time. 
Um, we're, on the, we're on our way, as you're about to see, but uh, one of the few. Uh, and City of York Council set a, a, a similar uh, target. And then heritage craft skills. Um, we're incredibly lucky uh, that we're one of 13 of the uh, English cathedrals that has their own works department. That's a rarity. Um, and uh, we entered into a 20-year plan to restore um, our medieval stained glass windows and put protection in front of them seven years ago. At the current rate of repair, we'd have another 30 years ahead of us. So we need to be doing more repair for the same amount of money and, and really get on top of this. So... I'm rather embarrassed about this slide, Laura, because yours were so professional. This is a little bit amateur, but the reason I did it was to show the sheer weight of planning law that sits above my team and I in caring for this magnificent building. Um, four Acts of Parliament there. Um, and then orbiting, you've got all of our statutory consultees and our stakeholders who have such an important say in, in what we do in looking after this building. Um, so long story short... York hasn't had an adopted local plan since 1968. So there's no planning policy within which to, to drive change in the city. The emerging local plan didn't even mention York Minster. And um, their um, net zero policies were, were, were nearly as bad as the MPPF. So um, I used the uh, Localism Act, namely the Neighbourhood Plan, to create my own planning policy to take forward the change that was needed um, at York Minster. So 32 weeks of consultation, extensive feedback to bring the city and our local community with us on this journey. Um, and that was adopted in 2022 and now forms part of the development plan for the city. And the chapter of York have the first allocated sites in, in the city since the late 1950s. And it's essentially a zonal plan supported by specific policies around change uh, and adaptation uh, from A to F. But not just looking nationally, I look globally and anchored our um, policies within the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We can't do this individually in individual estates or in countries. This is a global issue that's getting worse. It was interesting, I was reading the news on the way down about the flooding that's happened in Dubai overnight. I mean, it's unprecedented and it's, it's scary. So, number of consents secured because they are um, supported against adopted planning policy. Um, this is our the York Minster Refectory, uh, a grade two listed building past the former Minster School. It had the first solar slates on a listed building in the city. And to begin with, even at planning committee, which was approved unanimously, the, um, the, the um, conservation officer spoke vehemently and passionately against this. It would ruin the setting of a grade two listed building and set a, an unhelpful precedent. You can't even tell that roof is generating 11,000 kilowatts of power a year on average that's running the air source heat pumps that's heating the building. It's not a huge uh, amount, but the tiller is hard over and the oil tank is moving in the right direction. And we were very lucky His Majesty opened it last year and, and uh, we spoke at length uh, about solar panels. He's been talking about this since the 1960s, so eventually everyone's uh, waking up. South Choir Roof. We got permission last year to put 199 solar panels on the roof. These will be operational by the end of the year. Didn't even go to planning committee. Because we've been talking about it for four years, the city were behind it, not one objection. So uh, those will produce a third of our power by Christmas. Um, College Green, biodiversity, um, well-being, mental health, all part of uh, the policies of the neighbourhood plan to, just, to create these little pockets of green space around the, pre uh, the precinct and turn land that was previously private into public accessible space. Um, awful photograph of Church House, which is now converted to 10 apartments, our first retrofit project double glazed windows, a, a state-of-the-art heating system. It is gas because we, we can't rely on ground source at the moment, but it, it's future-proofed to, to switch. Um, but the, the boiler is about this big, heating the whole building because it's so well insulated now with double glazed windows. Um, it's, uh, it's incredibly energy efficient. St. William's College, a mid 15th century um, building that's been empty for over 10 years. We've now got the um, consents um, to give this building a renaissance and to create um, chapters office headquarters there. Um, and then 8, 9 and 10 will become residential, where we will have solar slates on the roof, double glazed windows, insulated, etc, etc. So we're, we're on our journey. This doesn't look particularly exciting, but this is number one Dean Gate. We've got permission to next year to put uh, solar slates on the roof again, 
air source heat pump. But what's so important about this consent is we've got permission to put double glazed wooden sliding sash windows in, which is unheard of in the York City Centre um, on, on a listed building. Um, so it set the precedent. And on the back of that, I'm now working with the City Council to draft a heritage partnership agreement that will give me a five-year listed building consent to put double glazed windows in our grade two star, uh, great, uh, up to grade two star um, buildings. I don't know where that's going to go. It might go nowhere, but it's worth a try. And then um, our Centre of Excellence for Heritage Craft Skills and Estate Management, a training centre for craft skills so that we're inspiring the next generation of craftspeople to learn the craft, uh, how to look after these complex estates. Um, so joinery, lead work, we'll have a forge, um, stonemasons, uh, residential accommodation for our apprentices and visiting apprentices. Um, and it's been designed, as I say, to inspire the next generation and for visitors to the city wall to look down. Sustainability sits at the heart. So the left-hand building is um, covered in solar, creating the power to run um, the, the lights. Um, water is harvested from the beautiful roof in the main building and then stored to flush the loos and water the gardens. And then we've got a living roof on the far side building, uh, increasing biodiversity. So you can see the theme. Um, and then here, our um, new works uh, and technology hub is where we'll be putting state-of-the-art uh, cutting machines, um, photogrammetry, scanning. So we're embracing modern technology to care for the past. And we've partnered with um, institutions globally. Back to the point, this isn't a problem that the United Kingdom faces. It's a global problem. Everybody I've spoken to is dealing with exactly the same issues, whether it's in India or uh, Washington or New Zealand, our latest partner, exactly the same issues. Um, I should have said on this, uh, uh, my slide has been deleted, um, the uh, roof is covered in solar, so it's generating all of the power that is needed to uh, light the offices, and again, low energy. Um, so... Um, None of this would have happened without the neighbourhood plan. So I cannot emphasise the three points I'd like to take away from my talk are the power of good planning policy, adopted planning policy, the need for consultation, lots of consultation to bring people with you. The narrative now around net zero has changed so much, even in the past 18 months. Back to the point that the solar on the roof of York Minster didn't even go to the planning committee. Everyone's waking up to this issue. And I've forgotten what the third point was, but I'll, I'll remember later. And a lot of this, and, the, and what the government are not doing is, is talking about how the net zero agenda is actually a microeconomy in its own, own right. There's so many papers about this. We'll be saving nearly £90,000 a year. That's half a Navar window restored by saving power. So, and by Christmas, we'll be um, producing enough power on site to run three um, bedroom homes, 65 three bedroom homes a year. So, um, you know, we, we are moving in the right direction. At the third take was if we can do it, there's no excuse for everybody else to do it. All of those heritage protections and we're achieving this because of the power of planning policy. So that was my third takeaway. I hope that was 10 minutes. Oh, good. <laughs> Bear with me as I change the presentation around. I'm apparently accused of being the only architect in the room who uses PDF for not PowerPoint. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, six foot five on a good day. Six foot, six foot four in the evening, uh, very much dressed probably in architect garb. Um, I think my self, as my, my, hair, um, my hairdresser said to me today, uh, you still got a fairly good head of hair for a 42 year old. Anyway, um, I took that as a compliment. Yeah. Um, again, I've already been introduced. What I, learned, what I learned from that introduction was I need to make it a lot shorter. Um, so I want to talk to you today about three opportunities in heritage buildings and particularly kind of three projects that we've, completing, we've completed or we are in the process of completing. Um, one which we'll talk first we'll talk about Westminster Chapel, which is a grade two listed um, church, one and a half thousand seater church. In Westwood. So this is what it's, this was a photo of it in kind of 18, kind of 60. So it was just taken, Reverend Campbell Morgan, this photo, this incredible triple tiered auditorium, this amazing circular oratory of light that sat around this space. Um, our role here was to 
brighten up, bring light into a heritage space. From this kind of first image we took where we drew carefully the kind of what we found to how we would turn this building on its head and make it a new space for the community of this kind of grade two listed space in the middle of Westminster. It's a building that you'd have probably walked past but never walked inside. Our job was to bring people into the building, into this kind of auditorium that had kind of suffered and through kind of the care of others and our job was to try and kind of take back and kind of brighten up and open up this building to a new world around it. And we were brought in, we were the third architects to be brought into the project and as part of the project they said the pews will never go. Ecclesiastically the pews are a must, the, the, the planners will you know, take you to, you know, take you to the cleaners on take, getting rid of pews. And we reminded them that ecclesiastically in a, in a church, pews were a Victorian invention. And actually, we could sit down and think about the idea of what would a church be if you didn't have pews? What were the opportunities you could make in that space? How could it change? Then we got to the position of floors and the, the villainy of a carpet. And we thought long and hard about the idea of carpets in churches that ruin buildings and create that homogeneous space. But if you're in a project which is only, you've only got a million pounds to spend, we don't have tens of million pounds. This project was, we refurbished for 1.2 million pounds of money from the community itself. We looked at floors and looked at the natural ability. What could you make that had a natural feel? And I'm gonna talk, this is a journey we're on I'm talking about a rather wonder material that I'll talk about in a few different applications, which is the Caucasus Ocus tree. This oak tree that grows in the Mediterranean, in kind of in, in the Mediterranean at the moment. It'll be coming to the UK in the next few years um, as climate change advance, advances. Um, it is the highest agricultural paid job in the Mediterranean. Families, generations of families go through it, and every seven years a tree's bark gets taken off and gets made into this image on the bottom, mostly into those wine stoppers. 25 million wine stoppers a day, apparently being made through cork bottles coming through. This is what someone told me in Portugal. I don't believe them. It can't be that many, but that's what they say. But what happens with the rest of it? How does this cork get used? What's this byproduct that can be used that gets kind of repeated through time? How could it be, how could it be milled and how could it be turned into something better? How do we turn into something that could give people the joy of a natural environment and also insulate? So I want to talk before that about one thing which I feel really interesting. This, this graph talks about the kind of retrofit measures of a kind of a solid building and this idea that how much do you need to use an insulation to make a big difference to a project? What is 100% of kind of getting to the kind of an R value of three takes, you know, where our watts per meter carbon reduces down to four. The amount of kind of insulation you need to do that is kind of 300 mil. And on a retrofit building, on a historic building, this, this can dramatically and fundamentally change the kind of look and feel of buildings. We've worked on a, we're working on a project in the, in the church house, but we've added, and I'll talk about this in a second, eight mil of insulation, and it's made a 35% increase in performance. So I want to think about our role in, in, as kind of heritage professionals is to think about how do we decarbonize and obviously we have to decarbonize dramatically it's kind of incredibly important but should we be decarbonizing should we be trying to go too far or are we going too far too soon i tried to get on my phone just now the amount of energy that the uk is producing right now from renewable energy you know with alex's support you know at york minster we're probably up in the kind of 50 or 60 percent of our energies from renewable sources when we come to the energy that's coming on in the um online in the North Sea, we're going to be getting to 100%, we'll be exporting renewable energy. In the UK, are we the place where we could be talking about using energy to kind of, and harnessing it and storing it and, position, and positioning that? Children playing on beautiful floors in space, children running in spaces around these kind of positions. This is, the, this is um, Westminster Chapel and this opening up of the floor to create this kind of white and open space. Moving on to the church house, two church houses in the evening, who'd have thought of that? Um, this is the headquarters, I can't say, this is the, the, the um, this is the, I'm going to say the headquarters of the Church of England. I'm going to get in terrible trouble for that. It's the administrative court headquarters of the National Church's institutions and many other institutions. It is a building that in the 1930s was designed by Herbert Baker, grade two listed, um, designed as a steel frame. In 1937, that steel frame was encased in concrete as people realised that the war may be coming. 
This is the building where the House of Parliament moved to during the war. It's where the United Nations was founded. Um, it's where crimes against humanity was first uttered as the Nuremberg um, judges came into this building to discuss what would happen in 1944 as we knew we were going to... As the UK and the Allied forces knew that the war was going to end. What did we do? This happened in this building. We found it in this kind of classic, kind of civic state that we find a lot of buildings, the kind of suspended ceiling tile. And our job was to make a building of light for the followers of the light. A building of a space that could kind of celebrate light, could, be a, could, be, could strip it back to its bare essence. And again, back to my friend, Cork. This is where I talk about this kind of eight mil thick. So we realised that there was this, this cork granule that could be used. This is the granule here. It could be mixed and then it could be, sp it could be sprayed onto the walls. The exterior. Now this, this cork spray is breathable. It, con it controls moisture and you can spray it on and it's eight mil thick. And then you can cover it with a lime based plaster and you can kind of create this kind of breathable wall system. Also using a graphene based lime based plaster called graphene stone ecosphere which is a which is a plaster which creates a completely breathable wall system so you have a a system which enables kind of the building to behave as if it were in the past we sprayed it on the ceilings of this project and exposed it this is the ceiling and it actually becomes this acoustic kind of layer to create office spaces for the for the organization that's there now this is the building where the church of england had 50 percent of used to occupy the entire building they reduced it to 50%. The building is now, by the way, almost 100% let at rents which are looking at doubling the rent of the kind of building to the past. And all the money for this building goes back into, into the church's central fund as a donation to enable other retrofit happens. And this is just to give you an idea of that wall build-up and to kind of give you the position. This is a kind of an 8 mil to 12 mil thick build-up at different points, creating this kind of change in temperature value. And I'll show you in a second just the differences between the two walls. This kind of shows you the kind of the decrease from a normal wall build up to the kind of position of the cork working. And we did this. I have a wonderful man in the office called Mike who's 65 and he doesn't like using computers. He's a kind of, oh, you're kind of typical old school architect. And he said, I don't believe this. So he did it all. He worked it out by hand. And this is him working out, his drawing working out the kind of level of the kind of, the kind of, resist, the kind of the, the position of change. And this is that wall, the change in temperature of the wall between the two positions from the before and after and the depth of colour you get from that. And in a way, our role in heritage, in, in heritage is to kind of turn our buildings blue. Yeah? Take, when you look at a building from a kind of thermal imaging camera like this, the heat coming out is that yellow. And our role is to turn those buildings blue. And I think that's something really important. We should be thinking about that layer of kind of making buildings blue again in some ways. And this is the final images of some of those office spaces finished. Um, this is actually now the headquarters of the Methodist Church, which is now sitting in Church House. So it's a church house for all the churches. Um, what was important with this project is we actually sequestered 1,260 tonnes of carbon um, in the specification choices alone, not just through... The kind of not just through um, the kind of fabric upgrades, but through every choice, every material we took through with an incredibly um, kind of incredible client who championed sustainability. And I think someone like Alex in the in the room who is actually championing these processes is what we need in, in this in this world. We don't just need our, us architects. Laura and I can do as much as we can, but we need the clients who are going to be the visionaries to agree to put their put their kind of faith and their money where their mouths are in terms of sustainability alone, and it works. Finally, I'm going to talk about the Jubilee Pool in Penzance. This is a community-based project um, jutting out in the sea, designed by Frank Latham, 1935, to stop people swimming, these swim, people at the bottom of the image are people swimming off the rocks. It didn't actually stop that happening, but um, it was meant to stop them happening. Stop it the, stuff, the, the town council were like, shouldn't have people swimming off the rocks, it's dangerous for them, so we'll put in the swimming pool instead. So Latham, who's a kind of very traditional Cornish architect, starts thinking about the idea of how do you break a wave? So he makes a building which is curved, it's the only building he does it, it's a curved building, which is all about breaking the wave. Just from that point, that way, you get out to, you get out to, you kind of get to the middle, you kind of get to the path of the Atlantic Ocean, you kind of get to the Atlantic Ocean, you kind of get to the path of the images from 2014 where the building was destroyed pretty much or kind of wrecked by waves. And this is how we found it after this storm 
in this state and took 10 years from the beginning of the founding of the project through to kind of turning this building into a new geothermally powered um, pool where we use geothermal energy in Cornwall, the largest place in the UK for geothermal energy. We took geothermal energy from 410 metres in the ground to kind of heat a new area of the pool, this kind of area here, this new, this new um, pool which is heated at 35 degrees. Now the sea in this image here, this is an image taken in the summer, the sea is about 14 degrees. The, the indoor Lido pool is 18 degrees. And I can tell you, going from 14 to 18, you really, really tell the difference. And then you go to the geothermal pool at 35 degrees. And that 35 degrees is coming out of the ground. Free energy that is available year-round for people to use. Um, this year, right now, we're just going through a cleaning phase of the geothermal pump, so it's had to close for a bit. This is something that happens when you're using new technology. The silt got into the pump, so we're now kind of re-cleaning, but it'll be reopening in kind of about a month's time for the summer and the winter season moving forward. Um, this project was driven by the community in Penzance. In a this, town, this was a building that was about to... They didn't know what to do with it. It could have um, kind of ended and been destroyed, and our role was to kind of preserve, enhance, and create this new space for the town, a kind of space that celebrates that incredible light that if you, any of you have been down to the Penworth Peninsula, you'll notice, um, looking through and over the different pools for St Michael's Mount in the distance. And for me, it opens in 1935, and I have a personal connection to this project because, and this reminds me about that idea of heritage, it's what Laura said at the very beginning of her presentation. Um, in 1935, my wife's grandmother swam in the pool on its first day it opened and my wife's mother learnt to swim in that pool in that position and we were doing this project through lockdown and it was this wonderful moment when you're kind of working on a project you're trying to finish it in time you finish bits and you're going back wasn't allowed to see it and then in in the summer of 2020 um Freya my little daughter jumped to my wife in her arm, in, in to her arms, in that warm pool. She had never swum before. My other daughter is a great swimmer. She loves swimming. She's a water baby because she had done it every, every day. Freya hadn't had that opportunity. She was that young. And Anna turned around and said, do you know, this is the first time I've been in this pool. I, used to come, I came down every summer. But because this, the pool had been in that kind of state, it wasn't a space of kind of, you know, that we wanted to go to. It's now there. And my daughter swimming in that pool, and they go down every summer, and they go... Jubilee Pool, Jubilee Pool, Jubilee Pool. And to think that heritage is something that we have to preserve, enhance for that generation. Yeah? And how we can make places better is something that I think we all need to hold on to. And we can make this world better through heritage. Thank you. I think I've come from an audio description point of view. I'm wearing, I'm six foot two and a half. I'm wearing a brown corduroy suit that's reminiscent of a 1970s sofa. I have a limited hair on my head, but I do have quite a lot on my face, so it looks like my head's upside down. Um, let me just rattle through all these fantastic... So I'm not going to keep you long. Um, I'm just going to give sort of a five-minute, um, I suppose, a bit of a call to arms and a bit of a discussion and a bit of a positive spin, because we talk about skill shortages and so on, and I... I think we've got quite a lot to do um, as custodians um, of our heritage estates and, and the skills that we can bring to the wider sector. So by now, we should all know um, these little ditties. So 80% um, of the buildings we use in 2050 have already been built. Now, for people who deal with existing buildings, whether they're historically protected or not, that's quite an interesting fact. Um, a, it means we've got work to do, and B, there's a commercial incentive to be doing such work. So, whereas we know how to build structures in new structures in the most sustainably practicable way, and we do, and if we're choosing not to, that is a conscious choice. Um, you can pick on me later on that one if you like. Um, the big challenge is how do we adapt existing building stock? So, I suppose that's broadly why we're here, because retrofit broadly can be, just be described as sort of adapted reuse of existing buildings. The top um, definition is the legal definition of retrofit, um, and the bottom I would suggest there's not much difference. So I'm going to get in trouble here. I'm not too keen on the word retrofit um, because it implies that, it, the way we talk about it now is it implies that it's a new thing, requires new skills and so on and so forth. Now I would suggest that most of us have probably worked in, lived in, done stuff to existing buildings and existing structures. We might call it refurbishment, we might call it renovation, we might call it whatever. But I would suggest that even though the solutions on these projects may have differed, the issues that we had to overcome are probably um, similar. 
existing structures, um, failing plant, leaky roofs, whatever. So irrespective, again, of it being historically significant buildings, existing buildings, working within them is, is broadly the challenge. With that in mind, uh, here's some projects, not, not all mine. I would argue that all of these are good examples of retrofit. Uh, this is a, an archive um, in the Grade 2 star listed um, Colcott House for Lloyd's Register. That is my project ongoing at the moment, uh, uh, Close Controlled Archive. We'll all recognise the British Museum there. Q Palace, that's a lift on the outside of Q Palace. Um, and this is a wonderful project that I was involved with many years ago at uh, Durham Cathedral, building a new gallery and archive space and education spaces within 14th century fabric. So I would argue all of these are examples of retrofit. However, the objective wasn't necessarily to reduce carbon. So the only different that I, difference that I can tell between the skills that we apply in the heritage sector and the skills that were required across the whole of the built environment sector with regards to retrofit, if we consider this a new thing, is the objective, not necessarily the skills that are required. So we're talking about now, instead of focusing on accessibility or um, education or, or, or outreach or whatever, commercial, commercial viability, which, which is a lot of these projects have focused on in the past and, and adapted our historic building stock to, uh, to allow this to happen, now we're, they're changing the objective to be the reduction of um, carbon, whether it's in, in body carbon in materials or, or ongoing operational carbon. So, <clears throat> overlaying the issues in inherent um, existing structures with the complexities of uh, historically protected buildings, listed buildings, Alex has given a, an indication of the complexities with regards to sort of the governance and planning policy with regards to cathedrals. I argue that those who are well versed in the heritage sector and with a background of philosophy based in conservation are probably the right people to lead retrofit on a more wider basis. Couple that with the fact that we're pretty good at explaining the value of our projects because a lot of these projects, in fact, all of these projects, bar one, I imagine, probably required um, a significant level of philanthropic funding, probably from people like the Lottery Fund um, or Wilson Foundation or CLAW or whatever it may be. And as part of getting that funding, it's not just an investment choice. It's not a spreadsheet that says, put this money in, you'll get this money out. We have to demonstrate social value. We have to uh, demonstrate positive community impact. We have to demonstrate that these things are worth spending money on, the public purse on. So when we're talking about the wider need with regards to sustainable development, and picking up on the mention earlier of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, improvement lo of local um, economic infrastructure, regeneration, reduction of energy, um, designing for reducing inequality, and so on and so forth, we're pretty good at that too. So, although there is a general skill shortage with regards to trades and craft, and there was a fantastic um, roundtable today at the City and Guilds Foundation, which brought a lot of people together from across the, across the country to discuss the challenges of the heritage crafts, from a strategic and management point of view, we're pretty good at this. So I would argue that, um, as professionals with this conservation mindset, um, who force and use the smallest amounts of appropriate materials anyway, you know, we talk about reducing the amount of materials we're using with regards to concrete and so on, Come to me when you've you know, uh, cut out the rotten bits of medieval timber and had to specify scarf joints and so on. We've always done work based on the lowest level of intervention because it's about protecting the, the amount of heritage. So again, even in the materiality and design, we, we, have, we have good um, good expertise. Also bearing in mind, as I said, the complexities with funding under the scrutiny of boards, trustees, subjectivity of local conservation officers, creating specifically bespoke solutions. Um, we're challenging existing um, structures. I would argue that uh, we're all waiting in the wings to sort out the 80% of the buildings that, that already exist. And I think that although the construction sector generally is, is struggling with how to adapt to retrofit in other buildings, I feel like us in the heritage sector are waiting in, waiting in the wings to make some really positive impact. Um, I'm going to leave it there because I think we should get into some discussions and some spicy questions from our chair. All right. Thank you very much. We're just doing a little switch around in terms of chairs for the panelists for the Q&A session. So I'd just like to thank uh, 
uh, speak actually make a difference by how we specify and what we set out to achieve. So, in that regard, I'm going to open up the floor to questions, but I'd like to get one in first. Uh, I'm not going to be too cruel. Um, so, um, uh, Tom, you finished off with the, the government's 2050 net zero target. Alex, you referenced the uh, Church of England's 2030 net zero target. I'm grappling with the old Royal Naval College and whether we should set a net zero target. So, does setting an internal or organisational net zero target especially one on a shorter time scale than the government's, does that help or hinder your approach? Does it force acti activity and action? Uh, does it create impetus? Or actually, is it a horrifying thing where you go, how are we ever going to do this? I think it's, it's important for people to be ambitious, to drive change and to stress the urgency um, of what's happening to our climate. So it's helpful in that respect. I think the, the, the government possibly haven't been quite as ambitious for many reasons. So it's easy for smaller institutions to be more ambitious, but um, we do need the government's support at a national level to, to support us. I, I put a, a bid into the um, LEP last year, um, convinced we were going to get the funding for our solar panels because I'd got the planning consent and we didn't even get shortlisted. Um, and apparently for a pot of money for £6 million, they had £40 million worth of bids, which is great because everyone's trying to move forward. But I think I'm not going to get on my political soapbox tonight, but that is, <laughs> that's the big white elephant in the room. So. so in that regard, I am going to ask each one of you to get on your soapbox uh, <laughs> and a message for whoever the incoming government is uh, in terms of policy, policy suggestion to, to address our concerns this evening. So I'll start with Laura. I'm going to do a plug because Architects Declare have released a Building Blocks for the Future document and it sets out loads of policies, but my favourite one, which would help all of us in the heritage sector for the reasons that you mentioned, Tom, is regulating embodied carbon. Alex? Well, the government have a plan. It was, um, I think it was 2010 uh, it, it was um, published. Um, and it's people have stepped, successive governments have stepped back and back and back from it. So there's a plan to get us to net zero by 2050, but it's, it's 2024 now. So um, I think it'll be interesting to see which or how each political party approach this with their manifesto pledges. Net zero is expensive. The Treasury hasn't got any money. So we need to flip it and look about how we can make a microeconomy out of this opportunity. So... Um, Back off soapbox. We'll come back to that one. Yeah. Tom? Um, I, I'm not a policy expert. and Actually, I get a bit bored talking about it. And I like listening to people talk about it, but I, I'm, I don't feel qualified talking about it. I, I just want some sincerity and some stability in what we're trying to deliver. And I actually think there's more um, onus and potentially more potential impact can be made by the private sector um, to drive what we need to do. So, so actually... At the time, it wasn't great because someone threw a pandemic in the middle. But when everyone started declaring uh, climate emergencies, I, I felt like it was a really interesting um, and quite a profound change because we're saying sort of sod governance and policy and government. We all know there's an issue and we've got to crack on with it. So now, we, where we can, we design responsibly. That's a fact. The difficulty then is just getting clients to make the right decisions. So it's about education and engagement. So I have not answered your question, Mark. Um, but what I'm sort of saying is, I, I, governments come and go, prime ministers come and go, um, and I just think that we, when we're talking about buildings um, that are going to be here for decades or centuries, if we're doing our job right, we need to outlast them because we're more resilient than they are. Alex, okay, I'm trying to be humming, humming and hurrying over as I do the, the thing, which is maybe I'll do. I think firstly, invest in education. Invest in every single 18-year-old I speak to is passionate about, they understand the problems that are, we, are, we are in this moment, in this, in, in this position, and they are petrified about the future world we're coming through. But I see so much hope. Whenever I see an 18-year-old, they are the future. Actually, I think a nine-year-old has got more of it. And I think it, sometimes it's about helping them to achieve their voice and to grow through it. But actually, by the time an 18-year-old comes through their education and becomes active and becomes a decision maker, I'm not sure carbon is going to be the thing we're worried about, weirdly. And I wonder, 
because our energy, the energy systems we're using are decarbonizing so quickly, we talk about carbon because we've been, we've been all kind of hell-bent on oil and on petrochemical stuff. Actually, invest in the northeast. Invest in those towns where you could build kind of, you know, wind turbines off our coast or invest in kind of solar power in the global south or in places where, and, and the energy infrastructure to get power to us. So we don't need to think about carbon as a kind of, ah, oh, that dirty word, which it is. It's a dirty word because of the energy, the oil, you know, and the kind of gas that it comes from. Go green. You know, let's in, that's, what, that's what everyone wants. We, you know, we, we're, we've all got so kind of bound up in net zero carbon when actually energy is mm. the thing that we're talking about. You know, mm. and the amount of energy we use to build a home, we don't get priced at carbon you know we, we could all we should all have a carbon allowance you know if someone takes 10 flights a year that person should you know be buying carbon off someone in you know in a in a country where they don't have the opportunity to fly as much you know that could bring out equality but um sorry i'm on my soapbox i don't know we're getting into carbon trading there so <laughs> i'm very keen to go to the floor and take any questions uh, any hands up anyone Um, hi, I live um, in the city of London, in an estate which is listed uh, about the 1950s, and it, it's owned, in a sense, by 500 people who share that space. And I wonder how you would address retrofitting a complete housing estate. Who wants to take that challenge on? <laughs> was that, that was an architect, surely. <laughs> you said city of London retrofit, and that was I your know. thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> dive in. Um, is it the Barbican? Or Godling, yeah. Um, the, the, the interesting thing and the challenges, and this is good at me avoiding the question, but the challenges there is that actually we, we spend a lot of time talking about historic buildings, but new heritage is almost harder to deal with because of the challenges of the modern construction. It's all concrete with cold bridges and lots and lots of glazing. So you've, you've got problems with overheating as well, I believe. And so it's kind of trying to tackle all of those things. But I think the, the opportunity is that bringing community together and getting everybody engaged in the process could be a really positive thing and that and and helping people understand the changes that are possible that could be possible that would happen and making sure that it's a really communal process to enable that change and it might not all happen all at once it might take a while it's going to take a lot of money but it's it's that making sure that everybody's bought in to what needs to happen mm. I don't know if anyone's got it. No, definitely. Um, public consultation is absolutely critical. Um, but back to the absolute starting point, you need clarity around what you can and can't do. So something like that, I'd look at a, working with the local uh, authority to establish a supplementary planning document or an area action plan. I mean, you could use the neighbourhood plan route, which would be ideal for this, because it gives the power to the local community. You're not allocating land for resi, de resi development or commercial development. But like I've done, you can create your own policy to drive the changes that you're looking at. The problem with a supplementary <coughs> planning document and an area action plan, that's led by the city council. So it depends on what, what they've delivered in the past. And then you can start looking at architectural styles and, and what, what you can and can't do with the, with the listed elements. So, but bringing the public and the, the local community with you is absolutely critical. So that's why I'd start at the policy level. Did you have something to add, Tom? Yeah, I, I think, again, I'd try and bring us away from listed buildings a bit, which is probably you know, not, not what the... Yeah, I think it's all about listening. I think it's about listening to the people who know the building better than the consultants and understanding the patterns of usage. And I think sometimes it's about, sometimes the, you know, putting in double glazing may not be the answer. At Church House, we did a audit of this building and whether double glazing would make sense. They had, they had secondary glazing in the building, which we actually argued and got and took it out of the building because we worked out we needed to get it to naturally ventilate, the building to be natural, naturally ventilated. The putting, second, secondary glaze, so putting double glazing into that building had a payback, a carbon payback of like 900 years. So, you know, it's crazy. And also, then you have a window that busts after 30 years. You know, you're You've got problems with, you know, if you're in a custodian like Alex in, a, in an estate where that he's all, there's always going to be someone in that role, it makes social sense you can do it. But if, you know, we're talking about double glazing salesmen. Like, if any of you have seen White Gold, you kind of know the kind of feel of this. This is like, this system doesn't work. There's actually, we've got to look at 
you know, new systems. And I think, um, and I think human behaviour is part of what we all have to think about quite mm -hmm. carefully. Another question, I think David had one. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. Uh, David Stringer Lamar. I'm involved with a company called Fortis Consulting London, not directly in the built environment, but we certainly have some contact with it. I'm also the immediate past master of the worshipful company of Galicias, and we had a very good visit to, to York Cathedral in September. So I have, no, I have noted the comments there very well uh, there. So I spent a lot of my time essentially reading the financial press, and it follows on nicely from the gentleman's question there, all about the Museum of London. Now, my question is, of course, as I was coming over, I've just heard that the, the Secretary of State Hall has put a block on it, it's got to be revised again. But my question is, what is the framework that society needs to say yes to retrofit, or in fact, no, knock it down? What should the guidelines be? Thank you. So I personally, I think that there is a problem at the moment in the way we the, the literacy around whole life carbon assessments and what we're using to make these decisions based on. And as someone who's done them, and I, it's, it's a kind of muddy world of numbers and trying to get your head around what is included and isn't included. And if you go to something like the Marks and Spencer's debate, that was very, very public and very uh, fascinating to watch. <laughs> and, um, but that came down to kind of how different consultants have calculated the numbers and who's put forward what what argument and I think we just we need a better framework and I know that this is in the pipeline because there's a whole life carbon uh, working group that's working on dot, like net zero, the definition of net zero is but it's that clarity of what we are actually the numbers that we're presenting and being presented with and how you compare those and then make it make a decision based on the facts rather than the emotive rhetoric rhetoric around the kind of financial uh, mm. motives and things. So I think that's, that's where we need to get to, is a fact-based decision-making. And I think that, that is an issue in terms of, you know, from my experience, kind of accessibility of language uh, and process. Um, it can be quite baffling sometimes when you're trying to uh, kind of understand who's doing what. And that was a case in point for those who aren't aware of the Marks and Spencer's uh, debate. Uh, was one set of consultants saying it's uh, more efficient to knock m and down and rebuild new versus another set of consultants then coming in and saying, no, it's more efficient to kind of do, a, in essence, a retrofit. So I think that consistency of language, the accessibility of that is a massive issue in terms of the general public's understanding, let alone those working in the field and professionals. Mm. I was also going to add, because I think as well, this is, this is my personal view, is when you, it's quite easy to say, well, we're going to, I think the actual in that example in Marks and Spencer's, they, they kind of said, well, we're, gonna, we're building the Tesla version of the building, so you know, it's going to be super efficient. My argument would be is that we need to stop emitting carbon today. Mm -hmm. And so it, it doesn't really matter in 50, 80, 100 years' time what the carbon emissions that building are going to be. We need to sort it out today. And the, the statistics that came out last year on a report done by Arup with one of the consultants, I can't remember who else was involved, from uh, Circular Coalition, that said that <laughs> Europe and the UK will have exceeded our 1.5 degree budget of carbon emissions in the built environment by 2026. And so if we're, if, we're already t if we're already exceeding our budget, then we're just going to be stealing it from other nations that don't have that kind of... Don't, the, it's, it's, the, the urgency needs to be part of the decision making as well, I think. Does anyone have a view on Museum of London? <laughs> it's totally crazy that you know, you've got buildings where, you know, I was going to say my other soapbox would be 20% VAT on, yeah. you know, on, on, it's a no-brainer. And the idea that, you know, I've had so many clients, I've had to argue to keep a building which is fine when they've gone, no, but I get 20% off if I knock it down and start again. You know, this is, it's, and I think we've got to get to a really, we've got to get to a position where, you know, it should be the other way around. I think that we should be charging 40% of that on demolition, yeah? Now, just to stop, you know, that would be an easy mechanism, you know, to make people think twice about demolition or, and recycling. Like, loads of the contractors, every, all the contractors talk about, oh, I'll recycle everything from this project, you know, that kind of thing. Well, actually, do they? And if you were to follow that ceiling tile, does it actually go somewhere to be recycled? You know, I think there's a lot of greenwashing in this as well, but I think we need to, we need to kind of flip the, flip the head on this. No, in a serious way. 
Building on your point around greenwashing and, and Laura's point around um, sort of data and stuff, I suppose, as well. I think the issue, one of the issues that we have is that we're not comparing apples for apples on any of this. Hmm. Are we talking... If, if I put everyone in different rooms now and ask for a definition of net zero, carbon neutral, zero, we all have different, different answers for a start, let alone whether or not we're comparing apples for apples with regards to data and how we do any carbon accounting. And we all know, in the City of London, we're pretty good at creative accounting. So it's not <laughs> going to get us very far unless we really define what, what our parameters are. Likewise, with around the greenwashing, what's the standard for recycling? What's the standard for um, uh, biodegradable products? Oh, yeah, but does biodegrade? Yeah, but how long? <laughs> Quite a while. So, so until we define these standards and agree that that's the set, how do we create a, an ongoing toolkit that we can um, hold people to? Uh, so we need, to, we need to get that sort. And there are people working on it, and we, we just needs to be agreed. Quite frankly. Any further additions, Alex? I was just going to say, I, th I think this is bigger than a national issue, which are the points I've, I've made in my presentation. And, and we need to be looking at this globally as well. And I think it's just too big for an in, you know, individual nations to get their heads around and, and lead on. Some are better than others. And I mean, the United Nations has, has tried to advance through the um, Sustainable Development Goals, but I, I think it needs a global approach and guidance. And yeah. but. but there's not much action, even at the UN. Wouldn't it be nice if every single GCSE level student could tell you what net zero was or yeah. what those things were? And wouldn't it be nice if energy became a conversation, you know, not in physics, but it became a subject, yeah. or you know, carbon became a subject? You know, that would be the kind of real change that would be necessary. You know, if we think about it in a systemic, long term. And I think that leads on to a slightly wider subject, which was one of my other questions, uh, uh, about, obviously, uh, supply chains, uh, skills, uh, people with the right knowledge to actually deliver what we're talking about. Uh, and do we have that, going back to your point about education, Alex, um, any experiences you may have, whether it's sourcing kind of um, tiles or whether it's sourcing cork, you know, what, what's the supply chain? What's the knowledge like? What's the education in terms of delivery? Well, we have an amazing course at Kingston. Plug for Kingston University here. Um, we have a master's in historic Other courses building. are available. Courses are, <laughs> other courses are available um, in historic building conservation, um, which is a material science-led course looking, an architecture-led course looking at the kind of historic buildings. We're actually just starting up a, a BA in historic building conservation as well. So, um, and it's interesting... I think half of the problem here is how do we educate students to think that that's a course that's right for them? How do you get a 16-year-old to go, I want to do that, yeah? Um, I talk a lot to kind of children, uh, people from lots of different backgrounds about educating the kind of what does it mean to be an architect today? And we talk about this idea of being a doctor of space because we've got parents who are trying to get their kids to become doctors or, you know, kind of lawyers, and we're doctors, we are doctors of space, but we're also doctors of our climate, yeah? Mm. And this world, you know, why is it that a building, you know, why is it that an M&E consultant is an M&E consultant, they're sustainability consultants, if that becomes, how do we make these, these jobs sexy and interesting to a 14-year-old, to a 16-year-old, and they go, I want to change the world, oh, you can do it through the built environment, we can make those changes being a mason and other things. Um, I think we're better... We're, there's less in the UK, I think, in Europe. There's lots of people kind of pushing these boundaries, and I feel we need to get better at it. In Berlin, we're really it's kind of incredible the conversation. It's obviously a city that's suffered, you know, from much more, much harsher kind of destruction than we have. But I think, yeah, we've got to kind of, yeah, it's, it's global. Bells of wisdom, Tom. You. Yeah. Eagerly chomping. Uh, as someone who uh, found university the first time around, really naff. Um, and has only just managed to get a master's degree last year, I'm going to plug for the, under the other end of the scale here, that there's actually a need for um, craft training. You know, how do you entice someone to become a stonemason, a glazier? Um, how do we make that commercially sound? How do we get into schools and explain that it's, the right, uh, that it's an exciting and it's a fun thing to do? I, as I mentioned today at this round table, around heritage skills actually, at the, um, as I said, at the uh, City and Guilds uh, Foundation, um, when I, I, I used to work in similar roles to, 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 to Alex and, and Mark on, on the client side, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a fresh consultant. Um, and when I looked after Durham Cathedral, I always heard people turn around saying, 
oh, how do they build this? And I say, we still do it now. Mm -hmm. Come to the stone yard. Come and have a look. Try not to get excited about someone carving a massive rock into some beautiful tracery that's going to be up on a wall for 600 years. It's easy. What we need to do is entice people into, that, into those trades, get them the skills, move them forward so that they can build commercially viable businesses. But the challenge is that a lot of these crafts, um, craft skills are, are micro-businesses, tiny businesses. Um, so they can't take the time out, the master craftsmen can't take time out to go and train the next, next people. Mm. And I think it's great to have fantastic designers, engineers, architects, uh, so have you, but we need the right people coming through from, from other backgrounds who don't need degrees. They, know how to, they need to know how to deliver stuff, whether it's through apprenticeships, T-levels, or, or even you know, uncertified qualifications. They can just do a bloody good job, quite frankly. I think that's what's, what's needed and support for that. Alex? Mm. Um, well, I mean, that's the essence of our, the centre of excellence that we're, that, that we're building, this epicentre of knowledge that's collected from our, our international partners, um, and to share that knowledge um, on, a, on a big scale. So, and that's an under construction, it's going to open in August, but I mean, there's only so much that we can do from York, but one of the most fantastic institutions I came across recently is the Commonwealth Heritage Forum. And that it's a training forum across the Commonwealth that's upskilling um, craftspeople and, and the custodians of um, heritage across the Commonwealth. So I mean, they want to learn from us because we hold all of this knowledge in our collective heritage institutions in this country. And we should be sort of leading internationally on this. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, yeah, so my point about education is knowledge sharing and, and upskilling but sustainability being a golden thread running through all of that. And I'd just go a little bit further. It, it's it's very, very well talking passionately about it, but we also need to train the next generation around vi viability and commercialization because sadly the West are obsessed with growth and that's not going to go away. So the only way we're gonna put the spin on it is to make sure that everything that's been pr promoted, it, it, there's money behind it and the viability behind it and a return on investment, so... I'll revert to my 1972 limits to growth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Over 50 years later, we're just about catching up with that concept. Someone out there must have had an awkward question. There are some awkward questions, please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just putting, uh, Alex, on uh, what you're doing at York with the heritage training is fantastic, but <laughs> coming back to the financial side of things, the, the problem is that we undervalue heritage skills. Mm. I know for a fact that <clears throat> if you're building a, a new um, uh, high-rise residential block and you're laying a stretch upon brickwork all day long, in peak times you're getting 250, 208 pounds a day mm. for that. Mm. But a heritage stonemason or restorer, they're looking to make 200 pounds a day. So we are undervaluing those mm. skills. So we need to kind of recognize that if we want those skills and we want people to go into those trades, and do those, that difficult work, it's not just pride that they need, mm. it's not just the knowledge that they're going to do something for the next six twenty years. They need to feed their family and they need to mm. see it as something which is viable. Mm. And um, what you were saying, Alex, on, um, other Alex, on materials is very important. The, the challenge is that with the low carbon journey, uh, I have a SME which is trying to reduce carbon, reduce energy usage, reduce waste, but I know that for every Tech Crete or every, um, uh, every Heidelberg who are doing things to reduce their carbon, there's 100 or 200 SMEs who are not doing it yet, uh, who are a long way behind in the journey. And, you know, the, the challenge is for architects and clients is to drag all these small companies along, clients, uh, contractors, manufacturers, suppliers, that they need to also see that that's the way it's going and to get on that journey. So, you know, how, how can you as, as architects and consultants support and encourage um, all the SMEs around, all over the country to, to get on that low carbon, low energy journey? While Alex is uh, feeding back on that, so if anyone puts their hand up, then we can line the next question up. So I would say be brief now in yep. responses because we're coming to the end. Be evangelical, I think. The industry needs leadership and needs people to, you know, be passionate and to support, but also use the supply chain, use the, our ability to specify carefully and to choose the spe and to maybe write into our spec the specifications. You know, unfortunately, we don't teach specification in university yet, which I think we should. But to a good specification, you can write in these, these things into, and I think as in the professionals, we have to be own that position. 
and we have to get back on that world where we actually can be leading these things. Another question? Thanks. Um, thanks particularly to Alex for name-checking the Commonwealth Heritage Forum, of which I'm the chairman. So, uh, ah. anyone, who wants to, uh, <laughs> uh, anyone who wants to look up our website is welcome to do so. But my real question was about what place is there for behavioural change in the way in which we occupy heritage buildings? Because you can see from written accounts, you can see from pictures of the clothes that people wear, the way that the rooms are dressed, um, the external blinds and so on, historic photos, that there's a whole extra layer of things that we can and should be doing to make our buildings more habitable, as well as an acknowledgement that we perhaps should dress seasonally in order to accommodate the natural fluctuations in our weather. I, I, I'm quick, gonna, quick comments, yeah. I'm going to mention an, an, an example because it's actually, the, I didn't talk about it, it's one of the projects I've got upstairs. So we did some work with the National uh, Museum of the Royal Navy <clears throat> up in Hartlepool. Um, get out of London, everyone, it's quite nice up north. <laughs> um, uh, where we've just helped them purchase a uh, big retail unit and we're turning it into a uh, gallery. So if you know IWM Duxford or, or the uh, Fleet Air Arm Museum or something like that, we're turning it to that. And we made the conscious decision not to heat and, or try and cool or, or whatever the building and there's no clever engineering around um, you know natural ventilation there it's saying because it's a massive space and actually people are coming in to look at a helicopter or submarine mm -hmm. the ceiling so dress appropriately mm -hmm. cafe will be warm there come and have a cuppa so it's about it's about defining what you're trying to get out of the project the objectives of the project the use of the built environment and then aligning and then defining value, actually. Because when we have this, we talk about value, we, we tend to drift into cost. How you engage the building um, should drive how you design the solution. <laughs> so, so then you get the outcomes that you, 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 you need, I think. And I, from my perspective, can speak uh, in terms of the old Royal Naval College. In a sense, we're going backwards to look forwards. Uh, and in a sense, these buildings were designed in a way that actually worked. Um, so we uh, partitioned them, subdivided them, added aircon, added this, added that, and now we're looking at actually how do we take it all out, go back to the natural air circulation, the natural light, because that's how it was designed mm -hmm. by the architect mm -hmm. to work for people. So we're actually stepping backwards to go forwards uh, and, uh, as usual, learning from the past. Uh, so um, that's my perspective. I was only going to add to that. The, I, I actually think that people can be quite forgiving of older buildings and uh, as I, I own a 16th century house and it's very leaky and that you just kind of accept and, and, and acknowledge that that's how it's used and, and I think people, people are a bit more forgiving because, and they're willing to do that so it's just pushing it. Another question on the floor. Okay, uh, first of all, a quick plug. I'm, I'm also involved in the Skyline uh, task, the task Force and we're on the 23rd of May running a round table to encourage people to come along, how do we engage with schools? So employers, uh, so if you look at Chris Oldham on uh, LinkedIn, you can contact him. But my question was really about the, the funding and also insurance. So I guess for the new, the new stuff you're doing, how do you get it insured, but how do you actually find the money to do all this stuff? Or we'll go for Alex. Yes. Oh, so I've had to think a little bit outside the box. So it's been a bit of a funding cocktail. So joint ventures, um, debt finance, um, money from reserves. Um, we've been incredibly lucky that the whole Centre of Excellence has been underwritten by your Minster Fund, who do all of our fundraising. But for our new museum and learning centre, we're going to have to look at, um, at well, American philanthropy and UK philanthropy, um, because there isn't, there isn't the other money out there. So you've got, you've got to think outside, outside the box, so, and partnership working as well. So. For the, for the geothermal pool in Penzance, we got the last ever European Union grant to Cornwall, £1.8 million. Pounds. It, because it had a 50% risk, it had an over 50% chance of failure, which now asks the UK to government to give you a grant for something that has over 50% chance yeah. of failure. Yeah, I think it's HS2, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Lord. Laura, if you want to come in quickly, and I've got the last question from the lucky chap at the back, but if you want to quickly... Very quickly, tie, try and tie in, rather than, like, if you can't come up with immediate cash, try and tie it in with other works, like yeah. uh, plant maintenance works, and what's your strategy for, you know, ripping out your kitchen in 10 years' time, things, and just try and think longer term. You don't have to try and do everything all at once now. You can spread it over a period of time. Just make sure it's part of decision-making when you're thinking about those things. Yeah. Last question from the lucky chap. My question is uh, mostly directed at the architects and it's um, to do with fire. So in light of 
the Grenfell and also the fires at the Macintosh School of Architecture um, building and also Notre Dame in Paris. Uh, and and with, Copenhagen it, yesterday. And yeah, I mean, with, with, and I guess specifically in the UK with the introduction of the uh, Building Safety Act, how do you, how have you found uh, designing in heritage uh, with combustible materials such as timber, which is such a prevalent material uh, in heritage buildings? And have you found this new legislation stifling rather than sort of um, helpful in, in sort of dealing with heritage projects? Ending on a really cheery one there. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. Stifling yes or no, and then, uh, then a brief answer. Uh, I can only say yes, it's really, really hard, but thankfully I'm not really architecting anymore. So I don't, and deliberately after Grenfell, but I think that it is, it is piled on with all of the other challenges that we have to think about as architects, so it is a really tricky world at the moment, but... Um, yeah, that's not, not how the positive note that I wanted to end on, so I'm going to pass over to Alex. <laughs> um, I think, honestly, I think I found from the 1st of October onwards, the building control officers have gone into some sort of hovel or hole and got scared about mm. the questions of what happens, especially in particularly we've been working on a multi, kind of on the church house in particular, it's a very multi kind of exit fire strategy kind of building. Um, interestingly, the material question, no. I think I found people, I found really great fire engineers um, to kind of talk with and work, work together with and hand in hand, um, you know, and, gone, and going down on material science. Weirdly, part B of the fire, part B of the fire regulations, is guide, there's a guidance position in it. You know, if you look at the, the received document, 9 metres, 18 metres, 27 metres, 45 metres, what are they, the multiples of nine? What is the multiple of nine? It's a fire hose. Yeah, it's the length of a fire hose. So all of those things are not... The, you, you, if you use science to get beyond the question of fire... You know, fire, a fire doesn't kill someone, smoke does. Yeah, so if you go into those questions, you can actually be quite creative with the right fire consultants in the room. And I think there's a huge market, if, you know, to go into that world and kind of really kind of upskill that. If they can get the PI. Well, I think, I, I think the insurance thing is a real problem. Yeah. I think everyone's coming in and saying, for us, uh, we're a practice of 10 people. By the way, we all went stone carving for our Christmas party this year, and it was incredible. The energy in the room was just remarkable. Um, for, uh, but everyone now saying it's 5 million. It's 10 million. Oh, no, it's 20 million. And, you know, for a 10-person practice, the insurance on that is just... So that's a huge problem at the moment. So let's finish with the energy and positive energy. Uh, I think it's been a very enjoyable session this evening. I'd like to thank the Building Centre for hosting it. It's a very important topic. I hope we all go away feeling enthused and positive about this, um, <laughs> despite some of the <laughs> closing comments, uh, because I do, uh, and I want us to leave on a positive message. So we'll be around upstairs. There's an exhibition. Uh, enjoy that. Uh, and we'll be partaking in a beverage after us in a local uh, establishment if you want to continue the debate and conversation. So thank you very much, Laura and John. Just before you all shoot off, thank you to Mark, to Laura, to Alex, to Tom, and to Alex from the Building Centre. As mentioned, exhibitions open till 8pm. We do need you all out by 8, though. Um, if you've enjoyed this evening, the recording will be on our YouTube channel shortly, so look out for that. We all have also got our next Retrofit Meets panel discussion in this room next Thursday, and that's about the application of data in Retrofit projects, so do book to attend that. And we're starting our tours and webinars as well, and we also knew we wouldn't cover everything to do with heritage heritage in this one event so we do have an event later in the season on the 5th of June which will be looking at products and materials in historic properties and heritage buildings so look out for that we haven't published that one yet but look out for that that will be the 5th of June so thank you again Bye bye.